Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Miller Center. Welcome back to the Miller Center to so many of you for this pre-Snowmageddon uh, hour and a half of entertainment. It's great to see many friends and colleagues and students here today. I also want to welcome our viewers and, and followers online, um, some of whom are following us at hashtag election1800. <laughs> That's what I'm told. I don't really know if they're following us, but if they are, they're welcome on board. Election 1800. In about 10 months, Americans will go to the polls to elect our next president. Yes, I'm sorry to say it. <laughs> we have 10 more months of this. But you may feel saturated with all of the hubbub and the, the zaniness of the election cycle, but here at the Miller Center, we can't get enough of it. Uh, we live for this stuff, and we're just excited about being in a presidential season, 2016. And this year, 2016 presidential election uh, is giving focus to much of the work that we're doing, uh, in addition to the various public programs that we do on a regular basis throughout the year. We've launched an exciting project called First Year 2017. I just want to bring your attention to it. That program adopts what I think we could uh, generously call the Miller Center Method. We take the lessons of the past and lessons of history, as well as the most recent political uh, scholarship, and apply it to the present and ask, what should the new president, the next president, know as he or she enters the Oval Office? And that's something that we've been, uh, we've just been launching in the last month or so and we'll be carrying on throughout uh, the year of 2016, preparing the next president uh, for entering into public uh, office. We're not proposing in this project specific policies, you should do this or pass that, but rather trying to prepare the team. What's it like to transition? from the, the, the business of running for office to the business of actually governing. And what we're finding is that, uh, historian, uh, that uh, presidents in the past have actually struggled to make that transition. And it's been a really interesting exercise, and that's what's going to giving focus to some of our work this year. Because of the presidential campaign, we've decided to devote our popular lecture series on the historical presidency to this exact uh, topic, this exact problem. From Running to Governing, Presidents in the First Year in Office is the title of our series. Throughout the year, we'll hear from leading scholars of the presidency as they reflect on the challenges that previous chief executives have faced as they've made the transition from running for office to actually occupying it. Well, today, to kick off the 2016 series, the Center is extremely pleased to present two of the leading historians at work in the United States today. Our featured lecturer is Alan Taylor, the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Professor at the University of Virginia. One of our country's most important and influential historians, Alan Taylor has shaped the field of colonial and early United States history. In his many books, he's been a pioneer of new methods, such as microhistory, borderlands history, and Atlantic history. He brings into his work not just Anglo-American settlers and colonists, but Native Americans, the Spanish, French, Irish, and Dutch actors, and new voices from across the racial and economic spectrum. He's a scholar who allows us to see new angles of vision on the formation and the founding of the United States. He's a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize and a winner of the Bancroft Prize and the Beveridge Prize. And today he's gonna take us back to Mr. Jefferson's time with an exploration of the Electoral Revolution of 1800. Following the talk, Alan will engage in a short conversation with Professor Ed Ayers. Ed Ayers is President Emeritus of the University of Richmond, where he now serves as Tucker Boatwright Professor of the Humanities. A historian of the American South and a pioneer in digital history, Ayers has written and edited 10 books. His book, The Promise of the New South, Life After Reconstruction, was a finalist for both the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. In the Presence of Mine Enemies, Civil War in the Heart of America won the Bancroft Prize and the Beveridge Prize. We need a trophy case up here for all of these, all of these things, for these two men. Uh, Ed was awarded the National Humanities Medal in 2013. Ed Ayers served as the ninth president of the University of Richmond until 2015, and as you know, prior to that appointment, he was on the faculty here at the University of Virginia and also served as dean of the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And with that experience, he's emerged as one of the leading voices on the challenges of higher education in the 21st century. I just want to thank you both very much for coming to the Miller Center today to kick off this series. It's really an honor to have both of you here today. 
And with that, I'd like to invite our speaker uh, to come up to the podium, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Alan Taylor. I want to thank Will for that uh, kind introduction and to Ed for being part of this today. Uh, I have to confess I'm quite intrigued by this clock. Does this mean I have over three hours? <laughs> <laughs> and look, my time's going up. <laughs> You're all comfortable, right? Okay. Um, so I want to start out with a paradox, which is that the founders of the American Republic, the creators of the Constitution, created a nation which was premised on elections. And then it turns out they were very uncomfortable with elections uh, because they bought into the premise that as gentlemen, that it was unseemly to show ambition and it was particularly unseemly for them to canvass for votes. Now this then locked them into something of a bind. For example, 1788, James Madison privately confessed that he would welcome election to Congress but had, quote, an extreme distaste to steps having an electioneering appearance, end quote. He's not alone. February of 1800, Thomas Jefferson assured his daughter, Martha, quote, politics are such a torment that I would advise everyone I love not to mix with them. <laughs> At the time he wrote those words, he was Vice President of the United States. <laughs> and he was preparing to unseat the sitting President of the United States, John Adams, in the election that was coming up that fall. Now my point is not that Jefferson was some unique hypocrite, but instead that he belonged to a generation of political leadership who are caught between an ideology, that of republicanism, and the realities that they had to compete for power. And indeed, politicians of every stripe believed that the republic was imperiled and that that compelled them to compete for power. Now the great exception to this fear of getting your hands dirty with politics was Aaron Burr of New York. <laughs> he was handsome, he was dapper, charismatic, and he enjoyed politics. And he wanted everyone else to know that he enjoyed it. He was impatient with conventional morality and political pieties. Celebrating his own ambition, Burr bluntly declared that politics was the pursuit of, quote, fun and honor and profit. You can't imagine anybody else of that generation at the highest levels to admit to that. And in 1787, the creators of the federal constitution had tried to block the emergence of organized political parties and partisanship. To try to promote consensus among the governing class, they designed presidential elections that would be removed from common voters through genteel intermediaries, an electoral college of gentlemen who would be chosen by state legislatures, but would then be free to exercise their own judgment in order to cast two votes. And the two votes were not distinguished between president and vice president, but instead they were to pick the two gentlemen they regarded as most suited to lead the nation. And out of this voting, whoever came in first would be the president, and whoever came in second would be vice president. Now for modern listeners or readers, this strikes us as insane <laughs> because we assume that electoral competition between two parties is inevitable. During the 1790s, while political gentlemen were very worried about appearances, of appearing to be too forward and too involved in elections, this concern did not affect the editors of America's growing number of newspapers. The 100 newspapers of 1790 nearly tripled to 260 by 1800. And by that latter year, almost every newspaper identified itself overtly with a political party. And editors were notorious for provoking political conflict. Most had become highly partisan for editors thrived on conflict which sold newspapers. So you had this bifurcated political system in which the candidates were pretending that they were above politics, but they were becoming increasingly dependent upon highly 
politicized editors who were becoming more powerful than ever at motivating people to turn out and vote. So that voter turnout was growing quite steadily during the 1790s toward an all-time high by 1800. But these same editors who were themselves so overtly partisan and mobilizing voters would denounce any candidate that they could catch openly campaigning. So there's a double standard which attested to the transitional state of the political culture during this decade. Now, pushed by these rival newspapers, organized parties did emerge during the 1790s. As Federalists who supported the presidential administrations of George Washington and John Adams, or as their critics, the Republicans, who were led by Jefferson and Madison and Burr, and called themselves the Republicans. Both groups continued to disavow being political parties, even though they started to behave more and more as partisans. They continued to cast parties as selfish factions and divisive threats to the common interest, the assumed common interest, of a true republic. Jefferson declared, quote, if I could not go to heaven but with a party, I would not go there at all. Of course, Federalists didn't think he was going there at all anyway. <laughs> Now, each party claimed exclusively to speak for the American people, and they therefore cast their rivals as insidious conspirators bent on destroying freedom and union. Jefferson referred to, quote, the parties of honest men and rogues into which every country is divided. And he insisted that, quote, the Republicans are the nation, end quote. Federalists agreed with the polarity but reversed it. Quote, naturally, there can be but two parties in a country, the friends of order and its foes. <laughs> and both parties believed that the fate of the republic hung in the balance and that they had to discredit their opponents in order to save the republic. And so a dread of political parties is driving these rival groups to form parties. And then to practice an especially bitter partisanship meant to discredit and destroy the other party. So I want to invite you, if anybody tells you that we have partisanship that's unprecedented in our country, that you could be skeptical of that. <laughs> now, during the 1790s, the United States was not a superpower, but instead it got entangled in the fierce competition of the two superpowers of Western Europe, Great Britain and France, which were once again at war. And it was further complicated because France had just gone through its revolution. And so it was associated with a radicalism that was greater than the radicalism of the American Revolution. And this rendered support or opposition for the French Revolution in the United States especially contentious. Now, the Federalist administrations increasingly were shaping American foreign policy in favor of Britain over the course of the 1790s, which irritated the French. So they began seizing American merchant ships on the high seas in 1797, which led the Adams administration to begin to prepare the nation for war. For very partisan Federalists, this was a golden opportunity to discredit their opponents as traitors in league with French revolutionaries. And so in 1798, the Federalist-dominated Congress passed the Sedition Act, which criminalized any public attack, either in speech or in print, on the national government if a jury could deem those accusations to be, quote, false, scandalous, and malicious, end quote. Well, of course, juries tend to be as subjective as other citizens about the political opinions being expressed. So this exposed Republicans rather than Federalists to prosecution. Federalists were also quite disgusted with the many immigrants, most of them Irish, who were voting Republican. So in 1798, Congress passed a set of new alien laws, 
one of them permitted the president summarily to expel any alien deemed, quote, dangerous to the peace and safety of the United States, end quote. Another alien law increased the period of probation before one got citizenship from the then five years to 14 years. Now the Alien and Sedition Acts turned out to be quite unpopular, but what was even less popular were the increased federal taxes that the Federalists had raised to expand the American military in preparation for this anticipated war with France. In the spring of 1800, President Adams noted the decline in Federalist popularity, especially in the state of New York, which was pivotal in this election, and it had 12 electoral votes. Adams had depended upon those 12 electoral votes to win the presidency narrowly over Jefferson in 1796. Well, he's not going to get those 12 electoral votes in 1800. And he finds this out in the spring rather than the fall of 1800. So why would this be? Well, it's because the state legislature of New York would choose its electors for the electoral college. It's not by direct vote of common voters. And the legislative elections in New York were held in April of 1800. When those elections are over, it's clear that the Republicans have captured the state of New York away from the Federalists. And so they will clearly choose Republicans as the electors, guaranteeing to Thomas Jefferson New York's 12 electoral college votes. Now the man who made this happen was Aaron Burr. He had recruited a stellar slate of candidates and built an unprecedented political machine of ward committees and open houses to rally common voters by buying them drinks. And then to get them to the polls to vote the straight party ticket. Indeed, they would print up the tickets and hand them to the voters to just put in the ballot box. This was a time before there's a standardized ballot where you get to choose between the two parties. Instead, you would just go with whatever party you had accepted their ticket and you would just put it into the ballot box. And Burr was the master at preparing these prepackaged tickets. The Republican margin of victory uh, came primarily from New York City, and it came from increased voter turnout in the city's poorest two wards. A Federalist wondered how a gentleman like Burke could, quote, stoop so low as to visit every low tavern that may happen to be crowded with his dear fellow citizens. <laughs> but the Republicans nationally were very impressed by this success. And so in May, the Congressional Caucus of the Republicans decided that Burr would be Jefferson's running mate in the fall election. Now after this, Adams is desperate because he's going to have to pick up some electoral college votes that he did not receive in 1796 from some other state. And his primary hopes lay in South Carolina and Pennsylvania. Now, Adams suspected um, that the most partisan Federalists had become a political liability for him. And so he broke with them in the spring. And they were led uh, principally by Alexander Hamilton of New York. And Adams quite rightly concluded that Hamilton and his supporters were plotting to betray Adams by denying him a few key electoral college votes so that the Federalist's ostensible vice presidential candidate, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney of South Carolina, would become the president. So Adams started to pursue much more moderate politics. Above all, he sent diplomats back to France to see if there could be a negotiated solution to the crisis. This appalled Hamilton and the hardliners. And when a couple of Hamilton supporters in the cabinet tried to block this, Adams fired them from the cabinet. And this was essentially drawing the line that he was at odds with the hardliners and the Federalist Party and would try to win election as a moderate. 
Now, he's doing this not simply out of principle, but because this is his only chance to win the election. Now, Mod Adams' new moderation enraged Hamilton and the other hardline Federalists as a betrayal. In a stunning miscalculation, Hamilton produced a 54-page diatribe presenting his case that the president was mentally unstable. And this he circulated among Federalist insiders to try to push Pinckney ahead of Adams as the lead Federalist candidate. But who got his hands on this? Aaron Burr. And then he made it widely available and Republican newspapers published the juiciest excerpts to the embarrassment of both Adams and Hamilton. Adams later complained, quote, the party committed suicide and indicted me for the murder. <laughs> so the Federalists wanted to present themselves as the party of order, and they're undermining this by their own bitter divisions. And meanwhile, the party that they were casting as the party of disorder, the Republicans, were actually unusually united behind Jefferson and Burr. As we will see, they were too united behind the two of them. Now, during the campaign, Jefferson overtly followed the traditional playbook. He stayed at Monticello, on his mountaintop, literally above the fray. He wrote no essays for publication, and he refused to respond directly to the Federalist attacks on him. But Jefferson did write many private letters to political friends throughout the country to detail his views and to advise strategy. Paraphrased in supportive newspapers, these letters laid out a Republican platform that championed free speech and, quote, a government rigorously frugal and simple, end quote, which would reduce taxes, retire the national debt, eliminate the regular army, and shrink the navy. Jefferson also arranged funding for helpful journalists, including the scandal monger, James Thompson Callender. Jefferson declared that to secure victory, quote, the engine is the press. Every man must lay his purse and his pen under contribution, end quote. But those contributions of gentlemen had to remain secret. He concluded one political letter with a warning to the correspondent, quote, do not let my name be connected with the business, end quote. He didn't want to have happened to him what had happened to Hamilton with his pamphlet, to have the other size, side seize upon something he'd written and publish it with his name attributed to it. To circulate Republican views, Jefferson and Burr also relied on 90 committees of correspondence composed of local activists throughout the states. One Republican explained that these committees served to, quote, condense the rays of political light and reflect them strongly on all around, end quote. Republicans energized many common men who had previously been passive and deferential in politics. Republicans justified their innovative organizing and mobilizing as essential to save the republic from the traditional politics of deference which had favored the Federalists. Now those Federalists were more wedded to old school political restraint, and so they lagged in political and partisan management. But they tried to play catch up, and both parties were better organized in 1800 than they had been in 1796. Each side arranged public banquets and barbecues, often culminated by 16 toasts, one per state in the Union, to celebrate their political heroes and their beliefs. In the cities, Federalists and Republicans competed with parades complete with floats and partisan songs and the burning of their foes in effigy. This parading often became quite competitive and culminated in brawls between the partisans. Now, although the presidential candidate showed traditional restraint, with the exception of Burr, who was out there mixing with everybody he could, 
and traveling far beyond New York to campaign. The other candidates stayed home, but many of their local champions innovated by directly canvassing among common men. A leading Federalist complained, quote, men of the first rank condescend to collect dissolute and ignorant mobs of hundreds of individuals to whom they make long speeches in the open air, end quote. In October, a South Carolinian noted, quote, we have never been so pestered with politics as we are to this day. End quote. On both sides, the campaign became dirty and bloody, as each cast the other as a vile threat to free government. Emphasizing social order, Federalists denounced Jefferson as a dangerous atheist who excused the crimes committed by French revolutionaries and allegedly longed to emulate them. A Federalist newspaper urged the voters to support, quote, God and a religious president, or impiously declare for Jefferson and no God, end quote. In response, a Republican journalist denounced Adams as, quote, one of the most egregious fools on the continent, end quote, and charged that he meant to become an American king. In Virginia, rebellious slaves proved a wild card in the midst of the presidential campaign. In August 1800, several hundred covertly rallied to the leadership of Gabriel, an enslaved blacksmith who plotted to seize the state arsenal and the governor of Virginia in order to demand their freedom. When the secret leaked prematurely, Virginia's militia turned out, arrested scores of suspects, and the courts began ordering their executions. Jefferson advised the governor, James Monroe, to execute just enough to satisfy anxious white Southerners but not enough to offend northern public opinion, particularly in Pennsylvania. Ultimately, 27 died in the gallows, including Gabriel, who was the last to hang. Now, in exploiting the tragedy, the Federalists played a double game. Addressing southern voters, they blamed the revolt on the egalitarian rhetoric that they said was recklessly spread by the Republicans, who allegedly adored the leveling violence of the French Revolution. Quote, the sound of French liberty and equality in the ears of these blacks led them to this desperate measure, end quote, one Federalist writer argued. But for Northern readers, Federalists highlighted as a hypocrisy the Southern Republicans who preached equality while owning slaves. Quote, he who affects to be a Democrat and is at the same time an owner of slaves is a devil incarnate, end quote. So a Connecticut Federalist wrote. Free men could expect only domination from slave masters who postured as Republicans, according to Federalist rhetoric in the North. But the Federalists sought to score points against the Republicans rather than to free any slaves. Now, the Federalist Constitution allowed each state to choose its own method for selecting presidential electors who were to convene in their respective states to cast their ballots on December 3rd, which was the election day in 1800. Now in 11 of the 16 states, state legislatures chose the presidential electors, not voters. Voters did so indirectly by electing their state legislators. A popular vote determined in only five states North Carolina, Kentucky, Maryland, Rhode Island, and Virginia. Now, three of those states permitted the election by districts. So it's not a winner-take-all for the whole state, which has become normative in the United States now. But each state legislature sought to game the system in favor of the majority party in that state. For example, in Virginia, the Federalists had been making gains, and they had captured eight of the 19 congressional seats in Virginia in 1798. So the Republican-dominated legislature says, we don't want to be giving up part of our electoral votes to this Federalist minority by allowing districts to salute to choose electors. So they shifted in favor of voter take all. Virginia Federalists howled in protest, but voters supported the Republican position when they voted for the legislature that spring. 
Meanwhile, Federalists in Massachusetts were paying attention to Virginia, so they adopted the same revision in their state to assure Adams of all 16 electoral votes in Massachusetts. By mid-December, reports from the various states confirmed that the Republicans had elected Jefferson as president and Burr as vice president, allegedly, with 73 electoral college votes each, compared to 65 for Adams and 64 for Pinckney. But party discipline had proved too strong because Burr and Jefferson had tied with 73 each. So who is to become president? Well, that's for the House of Representatives to decide when there is not a majority. But it decides in a very distinctive way. It's not by majority vote in the House of Representatives. Instead, every state will vote as one delegation. And what the candidate needs is a majority of the state delegations. So you could have a majority of the smaller states overall in the union, and you could elect the president. So there are 16 states in 1800. Eight of them have Republican majorities. And this is the lame duck Congress that's doing this, not the incoming Congress, which is overwhelmingly Republican. So you're saying, well, it's a Federalist Congress. How is it that they control eight states, the Republicans? And it's because they controlled small states. There are six other, uh, no, I'm, I'm, let me see if I'm getting this right. There are eight other states, and six of them, the Federalists, have the majority. So they could cast their states one vote for whoever the Federalists favored. But it has to be one of the top two. In other words, they have to choose between one of the two Republicans, Burr or Jefferson. Then there are two other states which are evenly split between Federalists and Jeffersonians. So they will have no vote because the Federalists will insist on one and the Republicans insist on the other if the Federalists choose to play a cunning game, which they did. They decided they could make the most trouble if they supported Burr. Now, there are a couple reasons for this. One, they know that Burr has no principles <laughs> other than the promotion of Aaron Burr. And that's the Republican they prefer to deal with rather than one that does have principles. In other words, he has an ideology and that will keep him from compromising and doing things for the Federalists that the Federalists want. The other consideration is there isn't a great deal of trust between Northern Republicans and Southern Republicans. So the Federalists are hoping to drive a wedge in. And though the Federalists cannot elect Burr on their own, because they can only deliver six states, they're hoping they can get a few Northern Republicans to stray, support Burr, and they'll get Burr in, Jefferson will be out, and the Republicans will be permanently divided. Now, while this is all going on, uh, the United States has just moved its national capital from Philadelphia, the leading city in the land, to Washington, D.C., which was not the leading city in the land. <laughs> it was a pretty crude hamlet which, um, in which some land speculators had very grandiose ambitions. And they had a very grandiose plan for what an immense city would develop there. A leading Federalist noted that no one co could, quote, converse with the speculators without conceiving himself in the company of crazy people. <laughs> and the, the members of Congress had to stay in boarding houses. And there were very few boarding houses but they've developed a much more partisan identity than had been the case in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, you would often find boarding houses which would have both Federalists and Republicans in it. In the new Washington, D.C., you do not find that. There's a strict segregation by party into Republican boarding houses and Federalist boarding houses, and this helps to enhance the partisanship. But the partisans did agree on one thing. Albert Gallatin, a Republican, concluded, quote, the federal city is hated by every member of Congress without exception of persons or parties. <laughs> but we know things have changed. <laughs> um, 
Now, in early 1800, most of the Federalists of a lame duck Congress decided, quote, it is much safer to trust a knave than a fool. Uh, this is how one Federalist explained why he supported Burr, the knave, over Jefferson, a man he considered the fool. Playing coy, Burr waited on opportunity rather than explicitly disavow the Federalist efforts on his behalf. Now, there's one Federalist who uh, says, this is crazy. Uh, and he, although he regarded um, Jefferson and Burr as a choice between two immense evils, one of those he considered much lesser than the other. He derided Jefferson as, quote, tinctured with fanaticism, too much in earnest in his democracy, and a contemptible hypocrite. Quote, but that's nice compared to what he wrote about Burr. <laughs> whom he denounced as, quote, the most unfit man in the United States for the office of president, end quote. Hamilton reasoned that Jefferson at least had some principles, however bad. Now, during the bitter suspense of um, January and early February, Federalists and Republicans both muttered about preparing for civil war. A Pennsylvania Republican, John Beckley, warned that the the day that the Federalists denied the presidency to Jefferson would be, quote, the first day of revolution and civil war, unquote. Through six days and 35 votes, the House remained deadlocked as of the end of Monday, February 16. To keep one side from exploiting any temporary absence of the other, the congressmen hunkered down in great coats on cots and had meals brought in to the halls of Congress. As the crisis dragged on, Federalists grew more uneasy, for as conservatives and nationalists, they dreaded the prospect of entirely disabling the federal government. Jefferson, Madison, and other Republicans kept up the pressure by hinting that if Jefferson was denied the presidency, they would stage a constitutional coup by convening their own convention to rewrite the Constitution along Republican lines. On Tuesday, February 17th, a moderate Federalist, James Bayard, heeded Hamilton's advice and broke the deadlock in favor of Jefferson by abstaining. Bayard recognized, quote, that we must risk the Constitution and a civil war or take Mr. Jefferson. One relieved congressman uh, was happy this was over because he said that if Jefferson had been denied the presidency, quote, what other result would follow but civil war? In that event, he anticipated that his head would not have remained on his shoulders for 24 hours afterward, end quote. So this was serious business. Now, sobered by this constitutional crisis, when we talk about now the transition to what is this going to mean to the party coming into power, one of the first things they want to do is change the Constitution so that this won't happen again. The Republicans dominated the new Congress, and with Jefferson's support, they crafted the 12th Amendment. It was ratified in 1804, in time for the next presidential election. The amendment obliged each member of the Electoral College to cast one vote for president and a separate vote for vice president. Thereafter, the president and vice president, one of the paradoxes is by having these separate votes, is that you almost certainly assure that they will belong to the same party. The amendment completed a transformation of presidential elections, elevating the role of voters at the expense of the independence of the Electoral College. Where the founders in 1787 had sought to preclude partisan divisions, the 12th Amendment assumed their inevitability. And democracy had prevailed over deference in the election. Jefferson argued that the federal government had to follow public opinion and tolerate free speech. On the eve of his inauguration, Congress allowed the Sedition Act to expire, while Jefferson quickly pardoned those who had been convicted under the law. To reward their immigrant supporters, Republicans reduced the period of naturalization back to five years from the punitive 14 years imposed by the Federalists. The victorious Republicans slowed the drive by the Federalists to build a powerful national government. Republicans instead favored a more decentralized union, which entrusted to the states all responsibilities but foreign affairs, 
customs collection, a bare bones military, and the postal service. Jefferson dreaded a peacetime military establishment because its great, quote, expenses and the internal wars in which it will implicate us will grind us with public burdens and sink us under them, end quote. In 1811, the United States spent only one dollar per capita, a mere 25th of the public expenditures level per capita in Great Britain. A French traveler reported that Jefferson's administration was, quote, neither seen nor felt, end quote. But his administration produced a fiscal miracle much longed for in our own times. He cut taxes while reducing the national debt. During their 12 years in power, the Federalists had increased the debt from $76 million to $83 million. Now, I know this always found, sounds charming to all of us now. <laughs> this is like in the Austin Powers movie where Dr. Evil holds the world hostage for $1 million. <laughs> During his eight years as president, Jefferson reduced that national debt to $57 million. Now, also quite significant is Jefferson reinvented national political symbols and public performances. He wanted to show his dependence on common voters. So he eliminated the quasi-regal panoply of power favored by the Federalists. He abandoned the grand political receptions known as levees that had been held weekly by Washington and Adams. Jefferson sold the presidential coaches with their silver harnesses. Instead, a shabby gentility became his fashion statement. A Federalist complained, quote, Jefferson is the supreme director of measures. He has no levee days observes no ceremony, often sees company in an undress, sometimes with his slippers on, always accessible to and very familiar with the sovereign people." End quote. Now, Jefferson was a wealthy man. He lived in a very nice house here in Charlottesville. He had exquisite tastes in French food and wines, but he established the enduring precedent that Americans would accept rule by wealthy men so long as they pretend to have common manners. <laughs> in his public statements, Jefferson struck a conciliatory tone. In his first inaugural address, he famously declared, quote, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists. Okay, well the subtext is, he wanted everybody to be a Republican first. <laughs> Jefferson preached moderation as the clever means to ruin the Federalists forever. With soothing rhetoric, he wooed moderate voters to abandon their Federalist leaders. Privately, he considered the leading Federalists as only, quote, entitled to be protected and taken care of as other insane persons are. <laughs> he vowed, quote, by the establishment of Republican principles to seek Federalism into an abyss from which there shall be no resurrection for it, end quote. He deemed his leading foes monarchists, and he privately declared, quote, I wish nothing but their eternal hatred. But voters rewarded Jefferson's moderate public tone with the electoral sweep he coveted. In 1804, the president won re-election in a landslide, capturing 162 of the 176 electoral votes. And he secured every state except Connecticut and Delaware. Republicans also captured supermajorities in both houses. 116 Republicans to just 25 Federalists in the House, and in the Senate, 27 Republicans to just seven Federalists. Never again would Federalists recover the presidency or a majority in either House of Congress. Now, Jefferson was especially indebted to Southern voters and legislators, for he won 82% of the electoral votes in the South in 1800, compared to only 27% in the North. The Federal Constitution's Three Fifths Clause gave just enough additional electoral clout to the South to enable Jefferson's election. Without that clause, Adams would have won the presidency in 1800 by 63 electoral votes to 61 for Jefferson. 
A Connecticut Federalist complained that Jefferson had ridden, quote, into the Temple of Liberty upon the shoulders of slaves, end quote. Southerners also comprised most of the Republicans in the House of Representatives. <coughs> Although the Federalists of the 1790s had not challenged slavery directly, they did try to establish a more powerful federal government. And many Southerners worried about the future uses of federal power. The admin Adams administration had also offended them by allowing American trade with the black rebels in San Domingue, what we now call Haiti. Now Jefferson was attentive to those who elected him. He refused to meddle with slavery reasoning, quote, that no more good must be attempted than the nation can bear, end quote. His administration sought to isolate and ruin Haiti, which he dreaded as a dangerous example to American slaves. In 1802, Jefferson's postmaster general, Gideon Granger, fired the free blacks employed in his department, reasoning that their circulation of information threatened to promote a revolt in the slave states. Jefferson also had political debts to pay in the West, where he swept the electoral votes from Kentucky and Tennessee, and where every congressional seat went to the Republicans. Now, Federalists during the 1790s had tended to treat settlers as little better than Indians, and had insisted they needed elite mentors. Republicans instead celebrated them as industrious farmers who redeemed a wilderness through hard work. Jefferson's administration promoted retail sales of federal land to common settlers by reducing the minimum tract offered to 160 acres, by offering a credit of four years, and by opening three new land offices in the West. Jefferson also pressured Indians to make massive land sessions to accommodate the expanding settlements his territorial governors made 30 session treaties procuring 200,000 square miles for a mere penny or two per acre. Jefferson promoted what he called an empire of liberty, which favored white men at the expense of Indians and blacks. It's a democratic but racially defined society that would expand relentlessly westward, creating thousands of new farms to sustain relative equality among white men. Now, to conclude, Jefferson described his election to the presidency as, quote, the revolution of 1800, which he claimed was, quote, as real a revolution in the principles of our government as that of 1776 was in its form. And so by this he means the principle that the leaders of the nation ought to follow public opinion. Jefferson's electoral triumph seemed to seal the victory of his political philosophy as the one true legacy of the American Revolution. Rejecting Hamilton's vision of a more consolidated nation, Jeffersonian Republicans favored more of a strict construction of the Constitution to limit the federal government and empower the states. But the Jeffersonian Revolution generated contradictions. The Republicans wanted to keep federal power expenditures and taxes low. Now that meant they could fight Indians, but they could not afford to fight European empires. Yet Republicans feared that foreign powers were out to exploit regional divisions within the United States, and in the event of war would promote slave revolts in the South and Indian attacks on the West. Regarding their diffuse union as precious but vulnerable, Republicans practiced a defensive imperialism, expanding the nation to push foreign empires farther away. Dread propelled westward expansion across the continent to consolidate a larger and presumably more secure Republican Union. By purchasing Louisiana from France, Jefferson averted war with France, and he avoided the enormous costs of military mobilization. He nearly doubled the nation's size and multiplied the potential farms that settlers could make. But the Louisiana Purchase compromised Jefferson's constitutional scruples because the federal constitution provided no explicit power to buy foreign territory. Jefferson had adopted Hamiltonian means to secure Republican ends. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Alan. It's great to see everybody. It's uh, good to be with you, and I appreciate all the hospitality the Miller Center's extended to me. Um, I have a bone to pick with you, um, of course, and uh, it's against your whole ilk of uh, historians of the founding. Uh, you get to invent all the great stuff, the machinery that um, on which our democracy runs, and those of us in the 19th century have to fight a war and. Anyway, we'll put we'll that behind us, but uh, the, the point being is... Uh, we want to talk about the Civil War. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> no, but I do want to talk about... We do talk about the great continuity of the accomplishments mm -hmm. of this era, um, and we're all grateful for them. I'm wondering to what extent, you know, you cr create that wonderfully textured account of what early politics were like. And these guys are basically inventing what it might be like to think of a system of winning office in this machinery they created. I just, and in the spirit of the, um, of the program the Miller Center is running about the first year in all this, I'm just struck by, if, you're, if you think of the continuities mm -hmm. of the practice of politics as well as the continuities of the machinery that we've inherited. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think there are continuities in the shift to this um, new Republican administration. He's going to keep the cabinet structure, which uh, Washington had invented and which Adams had perpetuated. Uh, the cabinet is not a feature in the Constitution. It's something that Washington invented. And Jefferson had been a member of that first cabinet as Washington's Secretary of State. Um, the House has sorted out its procedures, as have the Senate. In both cases, they had to largely invent them on their own because these are not specified in the Constitution. So there is an apparatus of governing the country, regardless of which party will govern it. And the Republicans have a choice. Are they going to try to reinvent all of that? But they decided, no, it would actually serve their purposes very well to try to get legislation to move forward. And so they did perpetuate it. Well, how about all the politicking and this vitriolic press and all that? I mean, were the seeds planted for the things that concern us to so much today about our practice of politics? Well, certainly in the period that you know so well, there's plenty of vitriol and the... And yeah, but you invented it, is my point. <laughs> Personally, I didn't yeah. invent it, no. Um, it's, you know, I think we can exaggerate continuities going forward, because I think the Civil War is a great rupture. Yeah. And I think there was enormous instability in the United States. It wasn't the kind of powerful union. Now, people like Daniel Webster are creating an imagined union that can be a nation that can command the imagination of people. And Webster is very influential. And people like Henry Clay and, and Abraham Lincoln are certainly all on board with this vision of the nation. Right. But there's a big chunk of the country that's not that prefers a more Jeffersonian vision of the nation as equality should be the equality of the states. And whether or not the United States is or the United States are right. uh, is not yeah. really decided until right. the Civil War. But I guess my question for you, Alan, is was there something about the way the machinery was created that, that sort of called forth people like, like these, uh, these editors and people mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. uh, candidates going to, to taverns to recruit voters. I mean, right. what was, we read that, that, that these people who were there at the founding and then are governing, who right. ran and then governed, right. are surprised and disturbed right. by all this. Did they not foresee what would happen? Was Republicanism just so strong that they couldn't imagine that people would act like people? Well, they believed that Republicanism would, um, that, that the Republicans had won the revolution and that the people who did not believe in the republic were all safely off in Canada. Um, and we see what's happened there. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So um, they assumed there would be a broad consensus going forward. And um, they were, of course, it was very bitter divisions over ratifying the Constitution. So it should have alerted them that this was not going to be easy to maintain consensus. Um, but the, the first couple of years of Washington's administration were pretty quiet, and there were, uh, James Madison was essentially the Speaker of the House and was moving right. Washington's legislative program forward, and then it all blows apart. But it seems to me that there is in American politics a recurrent effort to find enemies to the republic lurking. 
And this began with demonizing the loyalists. They were the enemies of the American Republic. They wanted to preserve um, the union of the empire. And then it recurs between the Federalists and the Republicans. It will recur again when Andrew Jackson is leading the Democrats against the Whigs. And it will certainly recur in the late 1850s, especially when the Republicans craft this notion of there is a slave power. So it has often been the party that can ride to power is the one that can most persuasively persuade a majority of the American people that there's an active conspiracy against their liberty. So it is kind of hardwired in a way. Well, into it's, the way it's, the it's I, yeah, I think it's become so. Is it too much to imagine the Federalists as the parents of today's uh, Republicans and the Republicans as the parents of today's Democrats? Well, I think that is a stretch um, because it, it's almost like there are pieces of the puzzle that have been redistributed. Certainly today's Republican Party says that it's more in favor of states' rights and a minimal federal government, but it's also in favor of a robust military. So they've taken one Federalist element, the powerful military, and they've then taken elements of the Republicans favoring uh, a dispersion of federal power and a smaller federal government and combined them. And I think the, the Democrats have done much the same thing. They want a robust federal government that they think will help to uh, produce greater equality uh, in American society. So in, in a sense, there's a, there's a Jeffersonian end a more equal society, but there are Hamiltonian means that have been adopted by the Democrats as the presumed vehicle to achieve this. Now, you and I did not rehearse this beforehand, and so people may wonder about this, what I'm getting ready to uh, do. Uh, uh, my resentment for you is well established, and uh, it's established, too, by the fact that uh, you have somehow seized the imagination of the American people with the Broadway play Hamilton. Uh, I wrote that, too. Yeah, I know you did. <laughs> and uh, you, you did come up with... Uh, quite a few lines that echo. I just want to... Will you uh, sing them? I, I will not sing them, <laughs> okay. uh, but, and uh, people can thank me later, but I do want to read you some of the lyrics from one of the highlights of the show with the evocative title, Cabinet Battle Number 1. Um, and uh, it's a, basically a hip-hop uh, conflict between Jefferson and Hamilton. I'm, I'm going to Which read is it. accurate. Uh, that, yeah, well, yeah, I'm, that's, yeah, that was yeah, my yeah, question. Okay. Uh, is it accurate and what does it tell us? And, and my real question is why does this period can speak mm -hmm. so profoundly to us in a way, mm -hmm. you know, even though your guys had wigs and look so stodgy and stuff, suddenly they're talking to us, okay? So, mm -hmm. so here are the lyrics. So Jefferson says, but Hamilton forgets his plan would have the government assume state debts. Now place your bets as to who that benefits, the very seat of government where Hamilton sits. And Hamilton says, not true. Jefferson says, ooh, if the shoe fits, wear it. If New York's in debt, why should Virginia bear it? Uh, our debts are paid, I'm afraid. Don't tax the South, because we got it made in the shade. In Virginia, we plant seeds in the ground. We create. You just want to move our money around. <laughs> Hamilton says, Thomas, that was a real nice declaration. Welcome to the present. We're running a real nation. Governing and uh, <laughs> Would you like to join us or stay mellow? Doing whatever the hell it is you do at Monticello. <laughs> If we assume the debts, the union gets a new line of credit, a financial diuretic. How do you not get it? If we're aggressive and competitive, the union gets a boost. You'd rather give it a sedative? A civic lesson from a slaver? Hey, neighbor, your debts are paid because you don't pay for labor. We plant seeds in the South. We create. Yeah, I keep ranting. We know who's really doing the planting. And another thing, Mr. Age of Enlightenment, don't lecture me about the war. You didn't fight in it. You think I'm frightened of you, man? We almost died in a trench while you were off getting high with the French. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, always hesitant with the president, reticent. There isn't a plan he doesn't jettison. Upon which president, Washington instructs them both to take a walk and go away. <laughs> so I think anybody would have to say, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's have a hip hop debate about state and federal debt. Nobody would have thought this was possible. So what is it about this that makes this resonate? I mean, why is this connected with us, you think? Well, it's interesting. The, uh, the person who actually did write those lyrics uh, is on record saying he's drawn to Hamilton because Hamilton was an immigrant. Right. right. Uh, and that he'd been born in poverty. He'd been born illegitimate. Uh, so in many ways, it's a classic American story of somebody who comes to the United States, uh, mm -hmm. manages to make money, get an education, and uh, achieve national power, just a step below the president. 
And I think there, because the United States is a country of immigrants, of many different ethnic groups, there's a desire to find something that's the foundation for the country. And that foundation has been identified as the founding generation. That uh, they are, they function in the ways that a more, that a country that is more ethnically defined, let's say the Germans uh, or the French, uh, even though those are both partial fictions, those ethnic identities, there is a tendency to look to some sort of time immemorial as the foundation, something mythic. Well, there's something quasi-mythic about the ways in which we elevate the founders. Right. Uh, because they have to function as our foundation for our institutions and our practices today. So does it strike you as a little strange that the hero in that story would be Alexander Hamilton? Uh, g given the, his, his origins, mm -hmm. we, I get that. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you would think of him as being conservative in mm -hmm. some ways, and yet mm -hmm. the, the show itself is sort of a celebration of democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, are we people just not really paying attention to what he's saying? or? How do you square those two parts? Well, it is a deep irony uh, because Hamilton, uh, I mean, at one point he was at this banquet where another speaker was going on about the majesty of the American people, and he pounded his fist on the table and he said, the majesty of the people, the people are a great beast. Uh, so he had adopted the deep distrust of common people. So when you're making a musical, which is meant to resonate Hamilton with modern viewers, I don't think you're going to be emphasizing uh, things such as Hamilton's preference for a political system in this country in which would have had a lifetime president and a lifetime senate, very much modeled on the British system. And uh, yet there's nothing actually wrong in what the, the musical does say. Yeah, no, <laughs> but it's a, obviously it's selecting elements of right. Hamilton uh, that do resonate with us. So that's, that's part of our problem is we want that past generation to be our foundation. And it works two ways. On the one hand, people say, we need to go back to what they wanted, which can be kind of hard in a country of over 300 million people. Um, and on the other hand, we want them to be like us. And they weren't like us in lots of ways. Their issues weren't the same issues that we deal with. Some of them are, but, but many of them are different. So here, and this will be my last question about this, and so people need to get ready with your questions. Uh, this seems to be, a, I mean, Jefferson really is kind of the, the buffoon uh, of the show. I mean, he, he's kind mm -hmm. of ridiculed. But we don't agree with that. No, I'm, and I'm giving okay, you an opportunity okay. to say okay. so okay. in front okay. of, okay. as the Thomas Jefferson okay. Memorial Foundation professor, I yes. thought maybe you'd <laughs> want to do that. Uh, <laughs> I don't work here anymore. If there's anyone uh, from Monticello, <laughs> I'm on board. Okay. No, 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 but okay. it, it's, uh, Given the Jefferson Memorial and the sort of the resonance of Jefferson, mm -hmm. given mm -hmm. all the things that you mm -hmm. said, the things mm -hmm. that he did, was the right. sort of, you know, has that, has Jefferson sort of lost that precisely because of race and slavery that we hear here? Right. C can, can he ever recover that vision of himself uh, that, that he had and that so many generations had of him as the great beacon of democracy? I, I mean, you know, ever is a very long time. Um, and I do think your point is, is quite apropos, that as we have come to think more seriously about race and politics, this has not done Jefferson's reputation favors. And it then becomes relatively easy to, f to foreground that enormously important issue and say that defines Jefferson. Right. Um, and I understand that, that there was in the past a tendency to skip over that issue to celebrate Jefferson. So now, in a way, there's this period in which Jefferson's is, reputation is suffering right. for the earlier neglect of a more holistic view of him in his context. But I do think there are uh, things that Jefferson stood for that are of enduring value to us in this country someone who felt that um, you, you could put greater trust in a larger number of Americans than you could in a smaller number of them who happened to be in office. That public opinion ultimately ought to govern this country and that it was the safest sort, source of protecting the liberty and the prosperity of Americans than anything else. 
is something that will always be associated with Jefferson and is something that is of enormous value to us. Great, thanks. Yeah. All right, so uh, there's a microphone in the back. Um, and uh, do I call on people? Do I get to continue this? Do, does Alan call on people? How's this work? Come, uh, whoever would like to ask a question, please come back to the standing mic and you can, uh, you can pose your question. And Ed, yes, you can, you can run the show. Yes, all right. Uh, since I'm already here and there's, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll just, but those of you who would like to ask, just come on back to this, uh, this uh, mic and uh, get in line. Let me just start out with one, if I may. Alan, what does Jefferson mean by empire? of liberty, and how has that become or not become the national motto? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, empire of liberty sounds like an oxymoron, that we think of empires as coercive. Anybody who's seen Star Wars knows that the empire is a bad thing. I think people should strike back against it. Yes. <laughs> I wrote that too. Uh, <laughs> So an empire of liberty, what could that be? Well, it's, Jefferson lays this out, and it's very complex. And, and my predecessor, Peter Onuf, brilliantly unpacked this all in his work. The notion that each state is a political community, and each of these political communities ought to be equal, but they could be multiplied across the geography of North America as American settlers moved and created new states, each which, of which is supposed to be equal, and incapable of coercing the other states, and that the union is just some sort of coordinating body for all of these happy states to be equal. Uh, and when it was said to him, well, you know, North America is an awfully big place. How is this all going to hang together? He said, it doesn't matter if it doesn't hang together. As long as they're all republics, each of these states, they could form several confederations, and they'll all be kindred confederations. Now, it turns out that's not, that's a beautiful vision, but it's unsustainable. Uh, to maintain political power over that vast territory without something more cohesive as a nation to hold it together. At least historically, people decided that it was unsustainable. And so a nation's been created, uh, and it's a nation that is now capable of projecting power globally. And the leadership of the United States has, and the public of the United States since World War II, has committed to the proposition that it ought to be promoting American values in the rest of the world in order to enhance the security of the United States, as well as doing good in the rest of the world. So that we are very much running an empire in which we say that the product of that empire is liberty and that our security is enhanced by that. So you can see that there is both a great change from Jefferson's time and also a powerful element of continuity. Who's next? I'll Bill. take it on. Thank you both uh, for coming uh, and terrific presentation. Alan, you talked about the peaceful transfer of power from one party to the next. First time it's ever happened. Um, in the second rap battle in Hamilton, it's the debate over um, whether to side with France or whether to side with Britain. Mm -hmm. Was that an issue in the campaign of 1800 and in, in the early days of the administration, how did that play out? Mm -hmm. um, and not just inside looking out to those two countries, were those two countries taking notice to the transfer of power and give us some sense of that diplomacy that was happening. Right. Well, there, there is a peaceful transfer of power. Um, but I also wanted to emphasize it almost didn't happen. Uh, if this uh, stalemate in the House of Representatives had persisted, that there, there, there very well might have been a civil war in the country. But the issue about foreign policy, foreign policy didn't loom very large in this election in large part because Adams had moved over onto Republican turf in the spring by saying, I'm going to negotiate rather than fight the French. When Jefferson's elected, the British think this is very bad news. They're of two minds. One, they think the Americans have a crazy political system that cannot last. And they think of Jefferson as he's just going to accelerate, that the Federalists had somehow kept the whole thing from falling apart, but that Jefferson's going to accelerate 
the insanity of Republican government and it's all going to blow apart. But they're also fearful because they've got some colonies right next door to the United States, Canada. And there's very great fear that, that they take certain things Jefferson said out of context and thought that he was a great international revolutionary and that he was going to be promoting revolution within Canada to try to overthrow British rule and introduce a republic there that would then enter into some sort of association with the United States. It turns out not to be true. But there was a great scare in early, the first two years of, uh, of Jefferson's administration uh, that this was going to happen. Jefferson is, he's a sensible guy. He wants to maximize American trade and minimize America's military expenditures and therefore he doesn't want a war with the British Empire. And he certainly doesn't want to fight the French. And so it's really bad news when he finds out that Napoleon has just coerced Spain into giving him Louisiana. So Jefferson and most Americans had always thought of the Spanish as the best of all temporary neighbors because you'd be able to roll over them when you wanted to take over whatever they had that you wanted. When you're substituting you know, the number one megalomaniac in the world <laughs> as your next door neighbor, and he's very well armed and he's used to invading other countries, this is really a bad development. And, uh, and the Federalists think they've got Jefferson hemmed in because they start saying, we must go to war. We must go to war with France. We must build up the American military. And they're hoping this is going to discredit the whole political economy of Jefferson, which had been to tear down the military and reduce taxes and reduce the federal government. And Jefferson's kind of stuck, and he is a Hail Mary. He tries to negotiate something. He just wants to buy New Orleans, at least. And then he finds out that Napoleon's gotten tired of Louisiana for a variety of reasons. And he's willing to sell if Jefferson and the United States will take the whole thing for $15 million. So it gets them out of this bind. And thereafter, relations with France will be reasonably good, but they will get worse and worse with Great Britain until we have another war with them, the War of 1812. Yes, sir. Um, could you speak a little more in detail about this uh, breaking of the gridlock in Congress. Apparently, one delegate decided to change mm -hmm. their vote. Mm -hmm. uh, could you speak a little more in depth about what motivated him to change? Was right. it conscious, or did the Jeffersonians offer him something? Right. Thank you. Well, I'll be glad to go into more detail, because now I've got four hours that I can <laughs> speak to. <laughs> yeah. It's a gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Um, I love that clock. Can I get a copy of that clock for my? Uh, Okay, where was I? Uh, it was a, a, what was your question again? <laughs> How the gridlock was The working. gridlock, okay. Uh, and James Baird. James Baird uh, was a relatively moderate man by Federalist standards, so he's not very comfortable with this standoff and the increasing talk on both sides about civil war. That makes him really unhappy. And he is inclined increasingly then to listen to Hamilton's mm -hmm. advice. But he's also a politician, so he wants a deal. And he thinks he gets a promise from, some, uh, from at least one go-between who claims that, they are coming f that he is coming from Jefferson. And what Bayard wants is a promise that Jefferson's not going to renounce the national debt, just say, we're not going to bother to pay it off which would have been ruinous for lots of investors and would have been pretty disastrous for an American economy that is a capitalist economy and needs investors. And he also doesn't, he, Bayard wants to preserve the National Bank of the United States, which Hamilton had founded. And Bayard believed he got at least winks from this go-between, that there was a deal. And then there's an additional deal, which is he wants uh, some of uh, his relatives and political protégés in the state of Delaware not to lose their jobs. He believes he gets winks on those scores. Ever after that, once this became public some years later that this was Bayard's understanding, Jefferson insisted absolutely no deal was ever done. But on all three of these issues that Bayard wanted these things, all three things were done. 
So I believe most historians think there was an understanding, but a sufficiently vague understanding that Jefferson could plausibly say, I did not barter in order to become president. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was really interested in what you had to say about the role of newspaper editors mm -hmm. in relationship to the emergence of parties. And it sounded like from your telling that media had a structuring role to play yes. in American politics. And so I wanted to know if you have sort of a, a working model for the relationship between media and politics and whether you see a, a great continuance um, between the role that they played in the 1790s and the role that they would play going forward. That is such a good question, <laughs> but I don't have a good answer to it. Um, That's all the time we have for today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, what I, your, your, suge your suggestion is, is, a, is a very insightful one and a very interesting one, so I'm just making stuff up in reply to it. Uh, I mean, I, th I think you could certainly say that our politics today in which the formal parties seem not to have much power in shaping the, the primary season and the selection of candidates. It's really quite remarkable when you compare it to early in the 20th century or, or, the, or much of the 19th century where conventions really mattered and party bosses could really ultimately shape uh, the message and the candidate. Um, and and now, deliver the votes. And deliver the votes. And now it seems that the only thing that can deliver the votes are television advertising. And it's up for whoever can raise a lot of money uh, and can craft a plausible message and grab Americans' attention spans for 30 seconds. Um, I'm sorry, what were you saying? No, sorry. <laughs> Where were we? <laughs> uh, the, that's the system we're now in. Uh, and it is one that is shaped by the diffusion, the massive diffusion. If you, if you compare how the media operates now to the way it was when we were kids, when there were three networks, and everybody watched one of those three networks and got a kind of consensus view of what the political issues at least were, that doesn't exist anymore. And so the politics today is, is much more free form and, and driven by a different kind of media than it was in my youth. It's interesting that the press has always been important, but it used to be sort of intricately important. I mean, every newspaper had a political identity. And now, generally, the idea is, is that they are, if they do, they shouldn't, and it's kind of hidden. And it, it, well, it, it, you know, it's, it's not particularly well hidden by Fox. Right. right. But that, I mean, that's the new development, right. is yeah. that coming out of the three mm -hmm. Walter Cronkite mm -hmm. era, th three network, that Fox is a reassertion of an older idea yeah. Yeah. Of, of partisan press and MSN right. and following. Right. So, yeah. But you're right. They still pretend to be objective. Right. Yeah. Yes. Can you speak a little bit, you mentioned Hamilton, um, about why he wasn't sort of the de facto candidate in that race, and then if it wasn't for his own personal failings later on, and then just the disadvantage electorally at the time of being from New York, if you think down the line he may have had a better chance without the Reynolds affair and these different things at being a serious Federalist candidate in subsequent elections, maybe versus Madison or Monroe. I don't think Hamilton, ever could have been a viable political candidate, even in the state of New York, um, beyond a state senatorial district. I mean, he never held statewide office in New York. He never held national office. He never was a congressman. And this, he, his power came through a point of office as Secretary of Treasury, and uh, through the power of, of his intellect and uh, the number of Federalist politicians that thought of Hamilton mm -hmm. as the great genius of the time. And you heard what a great rapper he was. And a great <laughs> rapper. But he kept his musical talents hidden in his own <laughs> lifetime. Uh, Hamilton could not shut up, which, which is a liability in politics. You, you've got to know when to be quiet. Hamilton had an opinion on everything, and a lot of his opinions pissed off people. And he, you ask him and he'll say it. Out of and even write it. And write it. And so he's undisciplined uh, in, in many ways. Now, he's a very disciplined man at getting work done. He worked himself almost to death. A very hardworking guy. But he's undisciplined in what he says and where he says it and how he says it. 
And so I don't really think that Hamilton ever could have been president. It's almost one thing that makes him an interesting topic for this. It's it's historians love him. I mean, historians love John Adams. John Adams was a terrible politician. Now, there's reasons why he only had one term. He's much more popular with historians than he was with anybody that had to work with him in his own time. <laughs> uh, because he's another guy that doesn't have a filter. Yes. Uh, Alan, one of the things that the Miller Center is trying to do with its first year project is to take a look at the way that a first year establishes a template for the remainder of one's presidency. Uh, and at the same time, to see the way that mistakes made perhaps early in that first year get corrected. Could you say something about how Jefferson's first year serves as a template for the remainder right. and whatever mistakes he might have made during that year, the way he tried to correct them? It's, 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 I think it's fairly hard to find many mistakes or significant mistakes he makes in his first year or two in office. I do think that these issues about he wants to establish a style for the presidency that is a truly Republican style, one which manifests through public ceremony the dependence of the presidency upon public opinion and the electorate in every possible way. Every public statement he makes, every time he appears in public, his um, his desire not to go down and speak directly in front of Congress to try to maintain that they're quite separate um, branches of government. In all of these ways, he's, he's very in tune with what a majority of the American people want. And so there is a real honeymoon that he has, has that lasts for four years which I'm not sure any other president succeeds in so dramatically increasing his share of both the popular vote and the electoral college vote between his two elections. And he also doesn't lose power in the off-year election. I mean, he doesn't, his, the Republicans don't lose seats in 1802, they gain seats. So, he, he was quite phenomenal at knowing what the American public wanted and at delivering it. His big mistake comes in his second term where he adopts the embargo uh, on all American commerce. Imagine this, if a president today were to announce that no more jets can take off, no ships can leave port, nothing can go across the border into Canada or Mexico, all American business is shut down. How would Americans take that? It, it would not go over well. No president would dare to do this. Jefferson dared to do it. He wasn't just shutting down trade with France and Britain. He was shutting it down with the whole world. No ship was to leave port. Nobody was to row a cargo across Lake Ontario to Canada. And then he calls out state militias to enforce this. And it runs entirely against Jefferson's philosophy about a minimal government that allows maximum freedom for commerce. Well, he boxed himself in because he didn't want to raise a substantial military to fight the British Empire, and he felt this economic war would suffice, and it didn't. It was, it, it was a disaster in every possible way. It's one of the worst policies any American president has ever adopted. The same guy who was responsible for being the great genius of American politics earlier. This was completely tone deaf. So it could be an argument that he, it went to his head that he had been so successful at rallying the American public and persuading himself that he was right in saying the American nation is the Republicans. And therefore, whatever the Republican Party would do, the public would fall in line behind. Uh, and Congress did fall in line behind him, and they did pursue these policies, but then they're very nervous about this after the Federalists start to make serious comeback, particularly in New England and New York, uh, in um, elections in 1808. Could you say it's one of the dangers of having a supermajority, is you can actually do what you want to do, <laughs> and then you're responsible for it, you don't really have the countervailing power? Uh, it is a risk. Yeah. Yeah. Is there another question? If not, we'll look forward to seeing everyone at the reception. Let's thank Alan Taylor. Thank you.